One of the biggest drawbacks that we see after having a kid is not un both the parents, they don't understand partners, they don't understand each other's emotions. Sometimes there is a discrepancy between what the child says and what the parent takes it. Right. Right. So you as a parent, you're supposed to understand what are the emotions that your child is experiencing right now. Right. And what is your child try to portray? When the child is throwing tantrum, the first thing that parents do is just ignore because this is this is an everyday yeah. telltale. But what happens, the child develops anxiety because of it. You know, when we talk about teenage, it's such a transition that happens with the child. The child himself or herself does not know. Hello guys, so this has been a long pursuit but totally worth it. Ekta has been very, very kind uh, to be on the podcast today. For everyone who does not know her, I'm wondering why. But Ekta is mm -hmm. a, a, a counseling psychologist, a relationship coach and uh, practicing, I don't know, for like how many years now? More than a decade now. More than a decade. Um, she can be found on Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn um, as Ekta Dikshit. And uh, my first obvious question that I'm sure that's playing on your mind as well. Why a relationship coach? What is a relationship coach and why do we really need one? So Ekta, you have a tough job at hand to explain that, especially to parents who believe like, why does anybody need to coach me on my relationships? Yeah. I'm I mean, sure you get a lot of that. Of course I do. And having said so, first of all, thank you so much for such a lovely introduction. And I'm so glad to be a part of this platform, which I think you're building up such uh, a strong platform for parents and kids to understand each other. Right. I think and it's the most pivotal thing today. It's Having so said so, um, when I talk about relationship, being a relationship coach, being a psychologist, we all know that what COVID did to us. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about something which is extremely recent, right? Let's yeah. not go far off. Uh, after COVID, we understood the importance of mental health. Yeah. We saw extreme high rise in depression, anxiety, a uh, lot of high uh, cases of divorce as well. Mm. I mean, when we talk about divorces, because people were not very well equipped with how to deal with each other. Yeah, it almost felt like people ba people were baking as many banana breads as there were divorces that I heard of. And I don't think that's a good uh, bit. 100%. Uh, not just, I think, banana breads, but <laughs> there were so many recipes just rolling out. Yeah. Having said so, I think relationship coach is extremely imperative to to bring out and talk about because we all have different issues. Let's say today, if I'm experiencing some kind of a lung problem yeah. or if I'm coughing a lot, I would just immediately go to the doctor. Yes. I would not hesitate. Yes. But if I think there is some kind of a discomfort in my relationship, why do I hesitate to go and reach out to someone who is an expert? Right. Right. It's as simple as taking opinion about it. Yes. The reason why we need it. And a lot of people think that um, I know my relationship well. Why do you need to tell me this? Right. It's because we all have different dispositions. We have different opinions. We have different, you know, two partners coming together. They have different, uh, you know, upbringing, judgments, opinion, uh, you know, their background, the kind of exposure that they had, the kind of experiences that they had. And these two distinct experiences and exposure kind of bring people together. And then they don't know how to deal with the gaps that they have in their relationship. Right. And which is why we need help to kind of bring them together to make people, to make both the partners cognizant of what's happening on each other's ends. Right. So, so that you're more aligned, so that you know that you can live with harmony rather right. than throwing tantrums every single day. Right. And you know, as, um, and I think for for people who get it, for people who get the space that two people can be on two different paths and yet completely aligned may sound very easy for us, but people often wonder that why does, why or how can an external person help me be better aligned with my partner or my child or my family? What do you say to those people? I mean, in that case, it's as simple as how you would go to a doctor and not really yeah. question the doctor's credibility <laughs> because they've studied for all long years. Yes. It's a similar thing. It's just that we've studied um, human behavior, yeah. human mind. Yeah. How do they function? What are the certain behavioral traits? Why do we form certain belief systems, right? 
I mean, for someone who's a layman, a lay person will not understand why do we do what do we do. Right. Sometimes, right. That's why there are a lot of our behaviors are a innate, mm. and most importantly, they are also unconscious. Right. And which is why, for us as therapists, we've studied those. Yes. And we've understood why is your partner behaving in a certain way, right. and how you and your partner can work together as a team and figure things out. You know, one of the first questions. Let me start from the very beginning of when a mother, when she literally conceives. There's something that's growing within her, but there's something that's also kind of sinking in her, which is, will this all go away? Everything that I own, my identity, you literally feel like, will I be known just as a mother and not X, Y, Z? You know, and, and that continues, that really continues yeah. For a while, especially if you decide to take a career break, you feel like you will never be back at it again. You feel like even if you've studied to be, a, you know, a you, even if you have a degree, you suddenly feel like you'll be outdated, obsolete, and nobody will want to have you back. And there's so much negative self-talk that you keep doing uh, on relevance. What would you say to those moms? So I think let's just go back to our uh, evolutionary times because a lot of it has to do with the conditioning that we've had, yeah. right? When a, a girl child has been conditioned, the girl child has been asked to be a nurturer, mm -hmm. right? To be a giver, to be someone who always has to tend to people, whether it's her family or whether it's her neighbors or whether it's people yeah. in general, yeah. right? A woman is always nurtured that way, like conditioned yeah. to be a nurturer, to be a giver, to be always tending to people in and around her. Mm -hmm. Whereas when a boy child is being conditioned, the boy child is being conditioned to be a tough, rough guy who has to be a provider, right. which means just go out hustle. So what happens? The entire narrative is, is, is being conditioned. Right. That's something which has been happening since the evolutionary times, right? It's something which is innate in us. Something which is our own personal disposition. Yeah. Now, no matter how much you try to not care for someone, you'll still care. Yeah. Because I think that's just our nature. That's just that's us. That's our disposition. Yeah. Right? That's us as women. Right? Having said so, I think a lot of it revolves around our, our evolutionary days where we are supposed to be in a certain way we are supposed to present ourselves to people and always take care and which is why uh, what happens since you're growing up you always you are tagged as oh you are a girl you are a girl you have to take care of a lot of things you have to take care of a family then as you keep growing older you have to take care of your husband your in-laws your yeah. family and then it keeps going on and yeah. then of course there's another tag that comes to you so there's always a tag which is attached to a woman right of a girl and then a woman and then a wife and a daughter of course and then the mother yeah the moment when she turns into a mother she feels that the child is my only primary goal that i need to focus upon right because the, the mother wants to give her best. So what happens? Suddenly the entire, all the other identity that's been given to her of being, uh, let's say a doctor or being uh, an engineer or being uh, such a corporate, I think even a CEO for yeah. that matter. Suddenly all the tags fall off and the only tag that she has is of her mother. So what happens? The identity changes, of course, like you said. And when the identity changes, what happens is you're looking up to only that identity because you want to make sure that you're brushing all your skills to be at the top of that game. Right. And which is why there's always a second thought that keeps popping up that what if I, you know, I've left my career right now. Yeah. Um, a lot of these things have changed today. A lot of these narratives have changed. Reason because A, India is a young country. Yeah. Right. And there are a lot. It's a huge chunk of young people. Which also means by itself that th there are a lot of young females which now have changed the entire narrative of hus going hustling and taking care. Yeah. Both, right? And they have to look after all of that. Um, I think when it comes to career for a lot of moms that 
you know they're always scared about whether I'll be able to go back to my work mm-hmm. or should I or should I not I think earlier it was the case of there was no que- no there was no case of question yeah you definitely had to leave the job but now I think women are taking stand for themselves they know that there is an identity that's attached because it's just not the identity of what work are you doing it's also being an financially independent person sure yeah so it's the independence that a lot of women don't want to a lot of women don't want to kind of let go of yeah so it's the independence that's attached so many women like a lot of moms new moms when they think that will should i go back or should i kind of yeah. skip this whole career game altogether i think a lot of women today are now taking step ahead they're changing this entire game like a entire female at workplace game yeah where despite having the kid tending to the kid for a specific you know after the yeah. the maternity leave they get back to work how can you, they do that a by start seeking help in and yeah. around in the house in the household whether it's family not expecting the family to look after everything but you know being financially independent enough yeah to have someone to cater to the rest of the needs that's required that's mandate yeah absolutely in fact i would i would you know very early on i just drew a and everything for me has to be excel spreadsheets and organize right the ocd in me but i think what i did was i said what are the non negotiables right. and what can i outsource the things i could easily outsource i outsource right like so spending time with the baby or taking the baby to the park or nursing the baby or putting the baby to bed all of that i said this is not things or play time i didn't want to outsource that i said what i can outsource i can outsource the cooking i can outsource the cleaning i can outsource yes. the the chores part of it right which is which is it's is okay right that's not going to be determined by my baby is not going to see how much laundry i have folded or not right 100%. so i'm like okay that can be so i think the minute we as women start segregating the essentials and the non essentials and figure out what when we ask for help what could be outsourced i think it was a huge huge game changer for me so i i totally reckon with you on that one um you know when a couple is going through that phase of having a baby there is one partner who is going through going through it physically mentally emotionally hormonally and the other one has to just play fiddle mm-hmm. like sometimes there's somebody says okay i'm feeling this i i feel sorry for the husbands because they sometimes don't know how to react but they just have to play fiddle so they go yeah. along and then of course somebody else comes and everything your relationship as a couple kind of dynamic just, changes the dynamic changes there is a new hero in the film hmm. how do you advise couples to take that in their stride like i don't remember the last conversation and my kids are 15 so we here we talking about new parents but hmm. my husband and me we have to have a conversation and in every maybe fifth or sixth segment sentence we've not brought, come back to the kid conversation i sense there's something off <laughs> So, you know what I'm saying? Like how do you right. manage to continue to stay the lead characters in your relationship? So, um the first things first that we see is we forget that where exactly what really brought the child. It mm. was two of you. Right. Right? And what happens suddenly the entire focus changes. I wouldn't say that the focus should not change, but also at the same time it's about weighing it well. Yeah. Right? a lot of couples the biggest mistake that they do is they do not indulge into a lot of novel activities mm. it could be as simple as maybe once a week um going out on a date yeah right? just spending time with each other it's not about not having a conversation about the kid or not revolving yeah. your conversation or your activities revolving the kid do it but there has to be some time it could be even having one hour a day which is just supremely you and your partner. Yeah. I'll tell you why this doesn't happen. Uh, especially from the parents perspective because of course now everyone's hustling so hard. People are not uh, working just for 8 hours, but it's more than <laughs> that. That's 8 plus hours. It's I mean there's work coming home as well. Yeah. So people don't find time, you know, practically that oh, you know, I don't find time even when I come back home I'm working. So I don't the only time that I get I want to spend it with my kid. right what happens is you do spend time with the kid but also at the same time who is the source of it 
so start spending time with each other because what really happens is it's you two who has to ha who has a long longer game comparatively correct so a doing a lot of novel things together understanding each other i think one of the biggest drawbacks that we see after having a kid is not un both the parents they don't understand partners they don't understand each other's emotions right. why the only thing that they understand is what my child is kind of bringing up right now okay yeah. is my child smiling right now yeah. so even sometimes small moments could be just two of them sitting together with the child the child is smiling and then them having a conversation right. could also bring good feelings between them right but revolving back to the same thing having that small time like a novel time where either going for a walk every morning that's something which is you wouldn't want to kind of negotiate with yeah. you don't want to compromise on that's something you're supposed to do. so have some kind of an activity every single day a lot of parents say we don't get time but it's not about getting time it's about finding time yeah yeah it's about finding time i know you'll have like 101 things to focus upon but find time so you can be together figure things out and do novel things it could be even enrolling for some kind of a class that kind of relaxes both of you right after a long day right, right? it could be even th those activities could be just twice or thrice a week right whatever you both like it's something you have to mutually decide upon so these are the little things a lot of parents actually miss out on we spoken about um, about that relationship and how we must make time uh, as as a couple to make that happen um tell me what are the typical questions that that couples really come back to you with uh, of course you've me you've mentioned that you must make time for it but what are the typical problems that they say that they face while making time for it uh i think the first is not having time mm -hmm. that's first things first it's like two parents like both of them they have a complete different mindset while bearing a child mm. right while nurturing a child say for example the mother wants to um you know doesn't believe in hitting a child but the father believes that maybe sometimes it's completely okay to maybe just give it a neck mm. but so different narratives of of bringing up the child can actually create a lot of ruckus right uh, not to say that violence is not the answer but there's always a way how you can deal with the child mm -hmm. even if the child is throwing tantrums you should know how to deal with it right it's understanding the child's emotion a lot of parents i think a uh, biggest question that i do face is my child is acting differently I don't know how do I deal with it. Right. Suddenly my child is just throwing tantrums. I don't know what to do. So in this case, um it's imperative for you as a parent to understand that what is your child trying to say? Sometimes there is a discrepancy between what the child says and what the parent takes it. Right. Right? So you as a parent, you're supposed to understand what are the emotion that your child is experiencing right now. Right. And what is your child try to portray or right. express right sometimes um there was a beautiful uh, video that i came across and i still remember this so vividly that um the child was definitely throwing tantrum and the mother just came down to the child's level and asked the child what is it that you're experiencing do you want me to does because the child was holding a doll so the mother asked do you want me to hold the doll is it too heavy so the the child still keeps throwing the tantrum then the mother says do you need a hug then the child is still throwing the tantrum so then the mother asks do you want dad to come over and hug you and then she just stops sometimes it's just about understanding because the child does not know how to, how to express it yeah through. yeah it's your job to ask right a lot of us when the child is throwing tantrum the first thing that parents do is just ignore because this is this is an everyday yeah. telltale so rather just you know leave it chuck it but what happens the child develops anxiety because of it why because the child understands that there's nobody to tend to me no one understands what i'm trying to say or express or m no one understands what i need so right. the parents it's parents job instead of lashing out just sit and understand why is your child behaving in a certain way yeah what need of your child is unmet 
um, transferring from toddler tantrum to what what parents consider as teenage tantrums, right? Where the parent feels like my child doesn't understand me and the teenager feels like my parent does not understand me. What really happens is does the gap widen and how can parents really go about, uh, how can parents really go about bridging that gap and, and you know, sealing that piece of communication? So I think this boils down to a lot of our childhood behavior, like I said. So when the child builds up this narrative, like in their own childhood, that I am not tended well, my needs are not met, where my emotions are not understood, the child starts to build walls. And that's when the child stops expressing. And that's when there are a lot of times what happens is that the parent what we call generation gap is nothing mm -hmm. but just not understanding each other's emotions. It's as simple as that. Yeah. It's not understanding what does your child need. What happens is the child is trying to keep up with today's trend. The parent is still, yeah, you know, holding on to those values, opinions, judgments that the parent had mm -hmm. long back since they, you know, the way that they were nurtured. Correct. Um, I think having said so, when we talk about teenage tantrums, it's all about figuring out that what is my child trying to keep up with? Yeah, there is a social, you know, that that social comparison, the social comparison, there is um, a lot of so shame as well that takes yeah. around, yeah. right, for a, for a kid, if the kid is not really keeping well, in terms of their scores, or maybe the way that they, they're not keeping up with the trend. Let's talk about the trends. Yeah. I mean, Today, teenagers are really, really stressed about, oh, I don't have this, what my friend has. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, stigma attached to, oh, I don't have this. Yeah. So because the kid does not know, the teenager does not know how to bring this up, there is a lot of to and fro. It's more like a tug of war that happens between the parent and the child because the child tries to ask for it and the mother and the parents don't know how to you know what the child is asking for so a communication is the first things first that sit with your child understand a what because you know when we talk about teenage it's such a transition that happens with the child the child himself or herself does not know right it, there's a surge of different hormones in the body right. there's so many things that's taking place a lot of parents they don't understand for one basic reason is they don't want to accept that my child is growing up yeah and my child can have uh, raging hormones. My child can have different needs than what they had earlier. Right. It's about accepting that if I'm growing, my child is growing too. So when you start understanding this, when you start understanding your child's emotion, there are a lot of changes that takes place. So sit with your child. See um, how are they, they, are they dealing with any kind of a peer pressure? Are they dealing with some kind of a social comparison? Are they dealing with uh, any kind of an identity issue? Because this is the phase when they are building up their identity. So right. once they know how to build this up, they can actually work together as a team. And first things first, you as a parent tell your child that we are one team. You and I are not different. I want to be in your team, so let's just figure things out together. Right. So these are the changes that I think we really want to bring about. So I hear you. And I still feel that there is a part of me which says that I haven't found my answer because I'm sure a lot of parents when they listen to this are going to say, okay, but we know this ekta hmm. and we're doing this, but we still can't seem to break through that wall. Yeah, because sometimes um, it's a very simple, simple funda. Like I said, a lot of things revolve or it begins from the childhood. When the child, um, I'll give you a simple narration to this. Let's say there's a child who's throwing tantrum right now, as a child, okay? Throwing tantrum, you're tending the child immediately, mm -hmm. right? The child understands that, you know, I don't have to throw tantrum. And then the child develops a secure attachment. Right. Right? Now, scene two. When the child is throwing tantrum, you're busy with your work. And all you think is, it's okay, just let him throw the tantrum. I'll tend to the child in a while. Yeah. So after you're done with your work, and a lot of mothers do this, a lot of parents do this, they finish their work and then they tend the child. 
So the child develops a mentality that in order to get attention of someone or to get that love, to get that, uh, you know, those, you know, feel the love and the care yeah. from the primary caregivers or anyone in my life, I first have to throw tantrum, which is why a lot of people who have this clingy behavior or they, they cry a lot or maybe they just are extremely expressive. They come from this anxious attachment style. They develop anxiety to get love. Then C number three is the child is throwing tantrum. And because parents are so busy with their work, they say, let him just cry. It's, it's an everyday tale. So I'll not care. The child develops anxious attachment style, um, avoidant attachment style. Why the child understands that there is no one in this world who's going to tend to me. I have to be my own warrior, my own hero. So I'm as answering your question that a lot of times when you can't break through, it's because the child maybe in their childhood have made up this mindset that I will have to be my own warrior. So I don't have to sit and discuss everything to my parent. Right. So I don't have to um, share what I need to because in the end, they'll not understand. Right. So a lot of times, you know, when you're discussing with your child, they can actually read through your you yeah, and I also feel that, you know, maybe sometimes I feel like parents catch it very late. Like you want to start being, you know, when the child no longer is going to be the one that takes your orders right. and is now fleeing the nest at 11, 12, 13. That's the time you need to suddenly exercise control right. and you need to get harsher because you feel like, Oh, until now you were. Now what happened? Yeah. Right? Why but there's now, a transition? Why is there a transition? And then yeah. you question the transition without knowing that it's not that sudden 11 to 13 transition. Yeah. It is the conditioning of 0 to 10 that has led to the transition of 11 to 13. 100%. You want to talk about the other sort of parenting style, uh, other attachment styles. You mentioned two of them. So yeah, they? so basically there are two of them. One is anxious attachment. The third, the second is avoidant attachment with the child learns to be their own warrior. Yeah. Third is a secure attachment where the child understands. I don't have to throw tantrum. And there is a timely attendance. Yeah. Right? And this is what I think that example that I gave you about the mother kneeling down to yeah. the child's level yeah. and asking what is it that you need. Yeah. It's as simple as that. The child develops a secure attachment style. So these are the three attachment styles and this is how we as grown up adults function. Yeah. A lot of times we see that um, either we or our parent, is, like our partner is extremely clingy to each other because we are so anxious. We see a lot of partners, they don't trust each other. There's a lot of jealousy. There's a lot of envy in the relationship. What's that? That's anxious attachment style. Right. Because you don't know how to deal with that anxiety that you've been literally breeding in you since your childhood. Right. Um, also, <clears throat> why do you think we're seeing so many children today, especially in their teens, feeling so anxious? Because the obvious question that the parent is thinking of is that we never needed it. So why do our kids need it? And what's the kind of pressure? They're leaving far more luxurious, comfortable lives, like we were hustling with the train and the bus and walking to class and, you know, trying to do it all on our own versus our kids have far more privileges. So why are we seeing children crumble so fast today? I think it's the, um, the one thing that has really changed since the boomers, the, the gen generation Y millennials is the reducing levels of resilience mm -hmm. and why do we have this low level of resilience yeah. is because we have a lot of exposure right now that we didn't have earlier right I and mean, when you talk about exposure like during our times we simply used to have televisions right even if i had to compare myself to someone i would be maybe comparing myself to some days when i'm yeah. watching television i would compare myself to a television actress yes an actor right today Cell phones are the most handy thing available. And as per research, approximately um, every single individual, they compare themselves approximately 73 times a day. Wow. With someone on Which screen. With strangers. 
Yeah. We don't know what exactly is happening on the yeah. other end. Correct? Yeah. Now, what happens with, see, for grown up adults, as you keep growing older, with your experiences and exposure, you realize that everyone's journey is different. Right? You understand that not everyone shows the best side, uh, the worst side of themselves. But as a teen, there is no filter. What you see is what you just take in. Yeah. And as a teenager, what happens every time you open your Instagram, you open your Facebook, whatever you see, you see, oh, my friend just, you know, had such an amazing holiday in Paris yeah. Yeah. or just went to Prague. And then you're like, listen, I'm just sitting here. So you feel like it is the social comparison that's causing. The so it's usually the social comparison. Second, we also see there's something called toxic parenting. Yeah. Where uh, molly coddling does take place. Mm -hmm. And I see molly coddling is actually toxic. Where you try to, um, I think, guide your kid for every single thing. That your kid is supposed to do this, that. So the child does not get a sense of autonomy. All you do is, you feel that you need to have an agency over your child. Right. You don't need to have an agency over a child. Let the child have their own opinions. Mm -hmm. You know, which is why we often say that, Ask your kid whenever you're making, you know, when your kid reaches approximately uh, eight, nine, ten years old, just sit with your child when you, whenever you make a financial planning. Ask your child, what do you think about this? Or what's your opinion on this? The child develops a sense of responsibility. Right. Right? Which is why it's imperative for you to understand things from a child's lens and not your lens. Stop having agency over your kid. So, toxic parenting is extremely, extremely, I think it's, it, kills your child's self-esteem. Molly coddling is one of those. You don't have to coddle your kid. You don't have to be mothering them all the time. You don't right. have to be a parent. See, it's usually called there are phases, right? Phase where you have to be a parent, phase where you have to be a friend. Right. So you know when to sort of draw the line. Yeah, when and, to and that's the always a question that should I be a parent to my child or should I be a friend? Yeah, so I think this should come when what happens for a lot of times we have certain beliefs, set of belief systems or values where I feel that my child who is um, 10 years old right now, 12 years old right now, I don't think I, because during my days, I don't think there was something called, oh, have having a night in with at friend's place. Yes. Right? Today, kids do it. Yes. So if you start comparing your life with your kid's life or the yeah. lifestyle, it's always going to be a clash. So right. start understanding what's happening right now. When you progress and you think that I don't have to have an agency by comparing my life with my child's life, yeah. you know you're drawing boundaries. Got it. So you need to know that, understand what's going around right now. And that's when you realize whether I need to be a parent or need to be a friend. Right. Also, I feel sometimes parents are, you know, especially so many mums write into us saying that, I don't have control over my temper. I lose my shit. Yeah. And the child bears the brunt with a whack or sometimes abuse. And let's, let's share with the parents that abuse is not only in the form of physical abuse, but also verbal and emotional abuse. Yes. Um, I'm sorry to say, but I'm sorry to cut you, but silent treatment is one of those. Okay. Silent treatment is one of the biggest abuse that you're doing to your kid. And you don't know how it's kind of breaking your child. Right. Because the only thing that the child is learning right now from is from the primary caregiver. Yeah. And when the child sees that uh, whenever there is some kind of a discomfort that I've done to my parent, my, my mom just builds wall. Yeah. And that's when the child learns. Yes. So when the child grows up into an adult, the child learns that if my partner says something which is discomforting to me, I'll stop talking. Mm -hmm. So you see where it's coming from? Yes, yes. There's so much of our childhood that actually gets reflected in our parenthood. And I also feel that, you know, I don't know if there's a terminology for this, but I also feel there's this this new form of abuse which is, which is lack of presence, right? Like, yeah. I know that you feel that you're with your child, but you're absent. Because, yeah. you know, I was just recently on a flight back from Indore, and there was the cutest kid, and he was just sitting, you know, on the other side of the aisle. And, and you know, he was maybe all of one and a half, and he wasn't even asking for the phone. But the mother was just, you know, and I, I don't mean to judge, but I just want to say that 
the child all the child needed was not that phone while he was looking into it he was just still looking here and there for somebody yeah. to get his attention and then yeah. you know i started sort of playing with him on the flight and then he was literally like the the seat ahead of me was playing with him the seat behind me was playing. and he was just a very happy child and that or even if you see in elevators right the kids are trying to figure out and there's not one human in the elevator that yes. actually looks the child in the eye yeah even if it's a child in the pram or child in the car and i just feel this lack of human interaction is just a different form of abuse because this child is not it is just feeling like nobody is interested in me and i don't know how that feeling is like he doesn't know how to smile or cool back or react because nobody's ever done that with him yeah so how are we going to raise a generation of more conscious parents who are aware that their actions is causing so much harm to their child that's actually <clears throat> irreversible yeah so what you said was beautifully summed up it's called conscious parenting where uh, parents are becoming extremely conscious of their actions yes. which also means that becoming aware of their own emotion yeah one of the drawbacks that we see is kids not uh, parents not being aware of their own emotion yes they try to a lose their temper Yeah. Now, for a mother who maybe must have had a lack of sleep, yeah. a bad sleep, uh, yeah. or must be going through some kind of a physical discomfort yeah. today, maybe experiencing a headache, as yeah. passe as that. Yeah. Okay. Or uh, might have had some kind of an argument mm-hmm. or a discomforting conversation, or something just stressing out at work. Simple as yeah. that. Yeah. And when you don't sit with your own emotions. Yeah. when you don't know what's happening in you yeah you don't know how to react to your child yeah. and when the child does something you realize that the child is a dumping ground whatever discomfort that i have let me just throw it on him yeah and right so a lot of times like in my family i have my nephews and everyone i often speak with them that suppose if my nephew is crying i'd be like tell me it's okay to cry but tell me what's happening okay sit with me tell me what is it i mean discuss with me that's right. the point So when you give them the space, when you give them that opportunity, right. the point is no one's giving them the opportunity. Yeah, that's the point. Because imagine you, if if no one gives you any any you know the importance, they want, uh, importance yeah. or opportunity to even discuss something or yeah. uh, ask for your opinion, you'd be like, am I even, even needed? Yeah, am I even needed? And I always feel like when you know parents get angry or they lose their shit or it's something that's stressing out at work. This is what I typically tell parents is that you know you're always coming from something that you're battling within. Yes. It's your own inadequacies that you're rubbing off on somebody else. And I tell them to sit with it. Even if it's just the bathroom, just sit with it. Yeah. Resolve it in your head and then go back and you know come and and share out of and parent out of a more fulfilled version of you than than a, than coming from a place of lack it could even be like you had a really heated conversation uh, at work and you know you and and i see this very often which is a lot of parents they're like walking into work uh, walking into home after work and they're still on the call, on the call. or they're like hey and you know they're just going like this and then they quietly go off into the room and i just feel like that is the worst thing that you can do because a child has been waiting or that spouse has been waiting for you for all day Absolutely. and it's the worst thing that you can do because you know it's 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 just not that same amount it's or same energy it's so transactional yeah it's so transactional and not mm-hmm. equal energy exchange right yeah. and i always keep telling parents that or or families that you know just wait outside the door finish that call <laughs> finish in the parking lot sit yeah. in your car finish that call and oh when you ring just before you ring that bell can i take that deep breath switch on the switches yeah and then just walk in with full energy of the next yes. role that you're going to play 100%, 100% because then you're just that energy exchange is just so different versus that he like you know it just like it just like bugs me so much <laughs> that i find it like uh, and and imagine as an adult i'm i'm not somebody who appreciates that So I'm sure the child has no way like you mentioned yeah. no way to process that and he feels insignificant yeah. at that moment and he's obviously feeling that work or the call or everything else is more important in the priority list so I'm assuming he's processing it very very differently 100% also what happens a lot of times 
like I said, you don't know where to set the boundaries. For yeah. us adults, we don't know where to kind of draw the boundary. Right. It's just not about work, but it's yeah. all about a lot of different things as well. Yeah. It could be me just wanting to spend more time with my friends. Yeah. Just moving out, spending time with my friends whenever I have some time. Instead of spending time with my kid, I would rather want to just escape. Yeah. So if ask yourself, did you have a child to escape? Yeah. Or did you actually bring this child into this world to experience something different? Right. right. To raise something which is a part of you. So uh, one of the biggest mistakes that I see even in parents is that they both are not very well aligned, both the partners. Mm -hmm. For example, like when the child throws tantrum, one partner says, okay, just give away the phone. Just give the phone and then the child is going to yeah. be shut. Yeah. But the other parent says, no, let me just tend to the kid. Yeah. Or maybe just give him some time, maybe he'll be okay. So yeah. when you are not aligned, the kid does not understand who's right and who's wrong. Right. So what happens as a good cop, bad cop Yeah. that takes place? And you don't know, sometimes one person becomes like a completely bad cop. Don't play that. Yeah. I think this whole fund of good cop, bad cop is so bad. No, absolutely. You know, this this reminds me of this episode when, uh, you know, for my book, which is going to be out very soon, uh, there's this interview and conversation with Priyanka Chopra's mom, yeah. Dr. Madhu Chopra, where she said, when I asked her this question, did you guys ever disagree on everything uh, or anything? And she said, Mansi, disagreements were only in the bedroom. And that line is so well etched in my head yeah. because the children never see the disagreements, so. especially on the on the things that uh, about the child, right? Mm. Like the fights, it never yeah. gets nasty or bitter or like I will say yes for a night out and he will say no, that, yeah. that sort of disagreement. But I completely understand uh, where you're coming from. And, you know, I want to add one more layer, which is very Indian to us, right? So we're not talking of a... Uh, uh, two parallel lines here. We're actually talking of a triangle because it's the mother, yes. father and the extended family because we're talking yes. about joint families. Yep. We're not taking into consideration that we're only living in nuclear families. So there is the mother saying something, the father saying something or at least if they're aligned and they're on the same plane. The grandparents are on a completely different tangent. No, you can see what the difference is. Thoda aur khalega kya farak padta hai. You know, tum, tum log ko, madab, you all think that we've never raised kids. Right. How do you manage the joint family dynamics while avoiding conflict? I think communication is the biggest key. And I think it's as simple or cliche as it can get. Right. But I see a lot of parents that don't, they literally nudge this entire conversation. Mm -hmm. Listen, it's not mandatory. Mm. A lot of couples, they think it's not mandatory to explain your in-laws mm. or maybe the extended family as to why it's imperative that the entire generation has changed right. and they need to be tended in a very different way. Yeah. Right? So communication is actually the way. Sometimes the grandparents want your child to maybe watch the television for an extra 5-10 minutes. Yeah. Just maybe tell your, you know, your, your in-laws or maybe your family member or your mother or your father who's who's supposing or uh, proposing this idea then why it's always about the why yeah and second thing is how do you express this is extremely important right a lot of times there's a backlash that takes place but mm -hmm. more than that usually it's 78 percent of tonality mm -hmm. and just the remaining 30 percent of 32 percent is what you say right so it's not what you're saying it's how you say what you say Right. So it's about just conveying it to your extended family as to yeah. why you don't want this to happen. Because yeah. there are other things to do. Now see, the grandparents basically come from a very different mindset altogether. Though they did raise the kid and when they come up and say that, you oh, know, we've also raised kid. Just simply tell them that maybe the situation has changed today. Yeah. And we're just trying to tend to what's happening right now. And I'm sure you're doing such a yeah. great job yeah. being their grandparent. Right? Yeah. So it's about talking about things that they're great at but also at the same time knowing where to draw the boundary. Yeah, yeah. I completely second that because I live with my mother-in-law and my father-in-law and like I think there needs to be only one person who steers the ship and one person in the driver's seat and that needs to be very clearly communicated. So example, if it is a request for a sleepover, they can have their opinions but there's the parent who drives that decision and of course as a parent you need to hear all sides of the story. The grandparents' version of it, the, the child's version of it, and of course, you know, your version of it. But I think it's very important to, de like you rightly said, draw the boundaries. But I love what you said, that 78% part of tonality, because I think 
we often say things we don't mean mm-hmm. and we shouldn't say it mean for sure. Yeah, right. it's not about, uh, we say things that are extremely mean or what we don't mean, but how do we say it does matter yeah. the most? Absolutely. It's like if I tell you that, you know what, um, I don't like the way that you, you yeah. do this, but if I, I tell you in a different way, like, yeah. you know what, Mansi, how about you do this? I think yeah. you're going to lo- like it. Yeah. Even I'll, I'll like yeah. it too. If it's more so suggestive rather than more yes, critique. Yes. So instead of using content, yeah. just simply use it in a very subtle way, sure. which is not which is not uh, extremely, it's, it's more constructive in nature yeah. and not something which is destructive. Lovely. It's as simple as that. Right. I'm going to ask the very obvious question that I'm sure you've been asked a hundred times which is the biggest problem that a lot of parents write into us, which is on uh, screens and the addiction. How bad has it become? How late is too late to correct it? And where does it start? I think uh, when you say late is simply look at your child and see whether your child is throwing tantrum when there's no screen time Mm -hmm. or whether your child is adjusting or maybe navigating their free time into something else when they're not being given free time. Right? right. So it's you as a parent who has to make, you know, use this as a marker mm-hmm. to see whether this is working or it's not working. So first things first, a lot of parents, the biggest mistake that they themselves make is when they are busy with something or when they don't have time, they simply hand over the screens to them, yeah. to the kid. When they say, listen, I'm busy, watch this till then. Don't do it. Mm. Rather, just give them something which is more constructive. Yeah. Something that can help them grow their own ability. Yeah. Or maybe their own IQ or maybe their cognitive abilities. As simple as that. Yeah. Give them a quiz to solve. It's about indulging with your kid. Yeah. Even if you're busy. See, I see a lot of parents, even if they are busy, they kind of, you know, make the kid engage in conversations. Mm-hmm. Ask them to maybe uh, give any kind of a narrative story. Or they indulge into something which is more creative in nature. Yeah. So try to enhance your kids' uh, creativity as well. Second thing is increasing their social circle. Yeah. We see a lot of parents, they don't even allow the kids to go down, play with other, you know, mates. Reason because, oh, this is not the time. Maybe if, you, if you're bored right now, just, you know, switch on the TV. One of the biggest drawback, kids and parents, they don't know how to deal with boredom. Yeah. Yeah. Let your child get bored. It's fine. Today even we don't know what to do when we are yeah. bored. When we, we don't have... Five minutes of waiting, we like kind of scroll Like let us scroll through. But why do we need to do that? Instead, let's not do this. Just sit with ourselves and just enjoy our own thought process. Yeah. As yeah. simple as that. You don't know how creative you can get when you're just sitting with yourself. Right. So, A, if your child gets bored, let them get bored. Because only through boredom, they'll get more creative. They'll find some or the other way. But when you talk about having a screen time, just simply have a specific time. Ekta, that was indeed incredible. If you were to really share top three takeaways for our guests listening to this episode, what would that be? I think the first thing first that I would suggest is try and understand your kid's emotion. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of times we're seeing high rise in uh, kids' anxiety and kids' um, anger issues as well, mm-hmm. of course. It's because they're not really getting this whole attention mm. right because a even if they're getting it it's a partial attention so a right. make it a time to have a play time with your kid right no matter how much busy you are try to tend to your kid you have to keep away your screens yes because you are their model yeah so what you'll do um is what they're going to do it yeah so like you mentioned that um, about one of your interview where it's about the disagreements, right? So one thing that I really want to put forth is it's okay for your child to see the disagreements, yeah. right? Like some kind of a, I think, conversations which are not much aligned, yeah. but they should see from a lens where even if something was way too distinct that my parents had, but they navigated through the conversation where they both got aligned. That's right. So it's about they need to really learn this. Yes. That it's okay to have agreement but also disagreement but yeah. also that should lead to agreement. Yes. In yes. the end. Yes. So make sure that you have healthy boundaries yes. that even if you're working, spend time with your kid, understand that molly coddling is not going to happen. Right. Right. If you're going to always keep telling your kid what to do, your kid will not be able to explore its 
own potential. creativity and yeah. potential. Yeah. If your kid is just exploring something, you you're gonna be like, don't do this, don't yeah. do that. Yeah. The kid is like, what do I do? Yeah. Let the kid explore. Sure. That's fine. Because but tell them whenever they're exploring something, it should come from a space of learning. Yeah. So whenever they pick something up, instead of telling them, don't do this, yeah. simply tell them, okay, what do you think about this? Yeah. What do you think this is for? Because it was just, I think, a matter of yesterday that I saw my nephew just opening the screwdriver uh, box. Mm. So my father was like, why would you do this? And I told him, Papa, let him do. Hmm. Let's ask him, why did he take this and what, what does he think about yeah. it? So it's about... It, this is how they'll start exploring Absolutely. life. What is it? Absolutely. So stop telling them what not to do. Tell them, fine. Tell them what is it they think about what they're doing. Right. right. As simple as that. Sure. It's about fair balance. I think rest parenting is not a huge job. You understand your emotions. Similarly, you'll understand where your kid is coming from. Absolutely. That's I it. think that's that's most most important. Thank you so much, Ekta, Thank for sharing that. time and, and so much wisdom with us. It indeed... Is I'm gonna say it's gonna reinforce so many messages that we um, drive home at Kids Stop Press, and I just feel like coming from you, it'll just be that sign stamp seal done. Mm -hmm. So thank, thank you so sorry. much for sharing. Thank you so much for having me. I think this was just a brief conversation that we had. We have a, a lot of things absolutely, to discuss. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> this is just just about scraping the surface at the moment. Hundred percent. Thank you so much for having thank me. Thank you.